Good morning. So uh, I'm a Canadian. I don't speak a lot of Swedish. All the Swedish I know, Tom has taught me. And it's very good Swedish. Jag älskar Swari. Yeah? Um, I'm going to talk today about physical literacy. Generally, as an introduction, I'm going to make it as sporty as possible. I come from a, the high performance sport background in Canada. And so I understand sport from grassroots to Olympic level. And I'm going to talk as specifically as I can to sport today, but I'm also going to talk more broadly about the role of physical literacy in communities. And this is a slide we use in Canada to argue that physical literacy hasn't been valued much. We don't have the term. I mean, it's a, not a new term, but it's not valued like literacy is. Swedish people and Canadian people value that everybody should be able to read and write. We're the leading countries in the world and getting that done, that's cool. That never made us healthy. It's made us knowledgeable, right? We're very knowledgeable people, but we're not yet healthy. So literacy, reading and writing, is not necessarily the only thing you need to have to have a culture that's healthy. You need something more. And perhaps physical literacy, or the ability to move, is the missing piece. We don't provide that in our cultures anymore, and I'll, I'll show you that as we move on. So I work at the University of Manitoba. That's in the dead center of Canada, at the very bottom of Canada, but from the east coast to the west coast, right in the center. We're about minus 30 during the January, February year, months. So nice t-shirt weather. <laughs> and uh, so for me, this is like balmy hot. Um, but in the summers, our summers are like this as well. But I also work now in the circus industry, in the very high performance circus world. I've shifted from sport to circus. Why did I do that? I did that because the circus people are interesting to me because if there was anybody who's physically literate, for sure, they might be them. So I study circus people because they're physically literate. I take what I know in circus and I transfer it to high performance sport, to recreational sport, to all sectors of life. So if you're curious, that's why I study circus. And I'll give you some circus examples later on. So I'm sponsored by a lot of people in Canada to do this work. And that's relevant here in Canada the major agencies are completely on board with the concept of physical literacy. This one right here, the Public Health Agency of Canada, is the agency that's responsible for safety of the population. And they have completely adopted physical literacy as a means to improve the safety of the entire population. That's an impressive statement. In addition, the thing up there with the letters um, shirk, that's the French version, that's the English version, is the Social Science Humanities Research Council of Canada. They're the social scientists. They believe that physical literacy is the means by which to create a social revolution in the world. That's a pretty big statement, isn't it? About restoring movement at the highest level. So they believe physical literacy is that, a social revolution, a social innovation. So, and I work with lots of other folks. So I'm going to appeal, as I'm already doing to you, both to your heart and to your brain today, because if you actually feel this emotionally, and I'll make it emotional, you're going to understand physical literacy and take it home with you in a very different way than you did before. I use this slide a lot nowadays because it's kind of, interesting to look at culture 
That right there is the first ever motor vehicle in the world made by Carl Benz, the namesake of Mercedes Benz. That's the first Mercedes Benz. 1885, three wheel vehicle. And it had a steam engine in the back, it had conveyor belts. And that right there was the manifestation of the mechanized era, the era in which we got conveyor belts and mechanization and culture. And you know what's really interesting? I had my graduate students actually go to a real library and go to the stacks of books back in 1884. So when they pulled that book out from 1884, there was a lot of dust on that book. But we actually look back all the way to the 1800s and the word physical literacy is very clear and evident way back then. It appeared in literature as a result of that. Because people got scared that we're going to be driving around in cars instead of walking from place to place. So therefore we're going to lose our lifestyle. So people said physical literacy is important. Cool. It kind of died out. And in 1947, three Americans in New Jersey made the transistor. That thing right there is super tiny. There's about four billion of them inside of here. The transistor was the foundation of computers. The electronic era was born after that device was made. And shortly after that, 1973, the first personal computer came out. I had one. I was a geek, still am. But in the end of the day, that personal computer was perceived by many in the world as being a threat to being active again because they're going to be sitting in front of it. They were right. So the word physical literacy, once again, in the 1950s and 60s, became very prominent in the literature, but died out. 1990 is when the WWW world became true. The internet was in 1973, but the World Wide Web really only has been around since 1990. And after that, a bunch of people in the year 2000 started using the word physical literacy again for the third time in history. And hopefully it catches on, and I think it has. About a month ago, I was in Geneva at the World Health Organization working on the Global Physical Activity Action Plan for the world. And we decided that we're going to insert physical literacy as the number one means by the number of, of, for any country, the first thing you should do is introduce physical literacy to your country as a means by which to get physical activity. That's a pretty big statement from an agency like the WHO. So I'm saying things are moving really quickly because it's social evolution. We haven't been able, none of those engineers made those devices to make us lazy, did they? They made those things to make us a better world. But the consequence has been a reduction in physical activity across the world. So we live, Canadians, Americans, Trinidadians, not so much Swedish people, but moving in that direction, in a movement suppressed culture. This is a good example of that. This is from England, a wonderful graph, where they actually show here that in 1919, this fellow right here, George, when he was eight years old, he was allowed to go from his house in Sheffield with a fishing pole and walk down here to this lake and go fishing by himself. Interesting enough, his great-grandfather, not great-grandfather now, but the grandfather, Jack, in 1950, when he was eight, he was only allowed to go 1.6 kilometers without an adult. By 1979, Vicky at the top, when she was eight, was only allowed to go 800 meters by herself. And her son, Ed, who now lives right over there, can't go any further than down the street. Now, I dare say, I know for sure that that's true in Canada, it's true in England, it's true in the United States, 
Is it true here? So every culture I've gone to, even though Canada and Sweden are the safest places on the face of the planet, we do this to our children. We've taken the free range behavior of our children from 10 kilometers down to 300 meters. And interestingly enough, in the United States, there's rules about free range chickens. Chickens that are free range, you can label them if they are given a certain amount of time outside and they get a certain amount of time versus outside versus side and they can move around a lot. So in the United States, they have labels for free range chickens. I think Sweden should be the first country to say, we have free range kids. <laughs> Bring back free range kids. Isn't that a nice idea? It's kind of fun. Maybe Sweden should be the place to bring back free range behavior. It would be interesting. But it's kind of a joke, but it's actually not, is it? Because our brains are completely wired by movement. We're designed to move, we're born to move. And our brains, I'm a neuroscientist by training. I study brain science. Our brains prune connections that they don't use. And every connection that you do use, it reinforces. That's called neural plasticity. The lack of free range behavior or the lack of movement in our culture has for sure undoubtedly changed the brains of our children. They're different than when I was growing up. They're recoverable, thank goodness, because the brain stays plastic. It changes constantly from in utero to death. That's why stroke rehabilitation works. So luckily we can recover it, but there are clear and evident signs that the brains of the children of today are different than the brains of the past. Largely done by us. This is Canadian headlines. Last year, a principal, a headmaster at a school, banned cartwheels in a school. You can't cartwheel. I literally phoned up that principal, that headmaster, and told him to stop such behavior because you're destroying the child's welfare by doing that. In fact, there's another headline from our Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Bureaucrats, administrators, remain fixated on protecting kids from a condition known as childhood. <laughs> These are real headlines. Those aren't fake. We have created surplus safety around our children. Not safety, surplus safety. And we think that that's good. In actual fact, it's killing our kids slowly, as opposed to harming them a little bit. So in the end of the day, we've created bubble-wrapped kids. And bubble-wrapped kids, I'm not referring to making that image related to obesity. I'm talking about each piece of bubble wrap is a psychological trauma that we have applied to the child that will be very difficult to remove later on. The story I'll tell you that came from sport, actually, is a lady that I met a few months ago. She came out very bravely in a circumstance like this. I said, try to remember a time where either a coach, a phys ed teacher, or somebody during a uh, parent or a recreation leader spoke to you in a way that kind of hurt you psychologically, hurt your feelings. A 45-year-old mother of three actually had in her purse and was courageous enough to stand up. She brought out in her purse, she's 45, she got this when she was in high school, she pulled out a ribbon that was black. And she kept that ribbon with her. And that ribbon was from the time that her physical education teacher gave her a black ribbon for finishing last. She carried that psychological trauma, that dagger in her back, which we can't see, physically for life. Words matter. Physical literacy, quality sport would never do that. Sport does that, quality sport does not do that. To me, physical literacy demands that we consider the words that we say to children and adults who participate in sport so we don't create that psychological trauma. That's part of physical literacy because that's toxic bubble wrap. How do you get that off? 
how do you fix that later on? So I'm gonna do a little exercise right now about our culture. I'm looking at the average age here, understanding who you guys are, so we're gonna play a game. Dr. Brissoni is a Canadian researcher who studies play. And she defines risky play, I don't like that term, I like risk and play, but risky play as a thrilling and exciting play that can include the possibility of injury. I like that definition, cool. Do I want my kids and did my kids participate in risky play? Oh yeah. Does all play need to be risky? No. Does all play need to be active? No. Sometimes playing with Lego is good. That's not all that physical. But in the end of the day, see this list right here? The six things that are the essential elements of risky play? Don't get your knickers in a knot, guys, because you know what? Getting lost doesn't mean taking a kid and putting them in a forest 20 kilometers away. <laughs> Have you ever seen when you get two chairs, like you're sitting on now, and you put a blanket over the two chairs? What will a five-year-old do? Go under, right? They're getting lost from their perspective. Standing up in that chair that you're sitting on is oh such great heights. That's what we're referring to here. Not the actual risk of using chainsaws in grade one. Or giving kids axes and throwing them at each other. Or knives and sauna in Finland. I've heard that that is real, is this true? Anybody been in Finland? So in the end of the day, I like Finnish people, camera. Yeah. <laughs> but here's the game. I want you to now think of a time when you had the best play time of your life. Your favorite play date ever. Think about it, put it in your head. And then, for the person at the very back of sitting all by yourself, make sure you hang with the people in front of you. Share your play experience with the people beside you. Turn around, talk, go for it. Talk about your play experience. And just pause for a second. I think you're gonna get the idea ready. It's actually an interesting experience to share. There was a Canadian ad that kind of did this just a little while ago, and I might find it for you. I've never actually showed it to an audience before, but it was an ad that did this. It actually filmed people older than me, so like my grandfather. And it filmed them saying, what was the best play experience you ever had? What do you like to do in your spare time? And a person, old, my, my grandfather would say, well, we'd go to the lake and we'd be chased by bears, we'd catch <laughs> some fish, and we'd skin them with our teeth and things like that. And we'd start a fire and we were eight years old. And then it goes to my era and it goes, well, we, we went off to the lake and did some uh, water skiing and we did this and we did that. And then it literally takes the kids of me at, at 21 and saying, well, you know, we went to structured sport and that was fun. And then the scary one is the next generation, the eight and 10 year olds. What's your favorite thing to do? Oh, I love playing Minecraft and I love playing Candy Crush. And then they showed that video of the favorite things of the kids to do to the parents and the grandparents and they start crying. Interesting, right? One generation transformation of what's valuable to a child. It's not their fault. I like Minecraft, but it's a balance that we've lost in one generation. Now, you guys just talked about your risky play or your play. Let's do a game. If your risky play included such great heights, please stand and keep standing. Excellent. If your risky play included high speed, please stand. High speed, high stand. If it includes dangerous tools or elements, please stand. If it includes rough and tumble play, please stand. Or getting lost. We almost have 100%. Do I make my point? Yes. So we've lost this. Imagine the brain of a person who doesn't know how to manage risk. Well, I'll tell you this. In Canada, childhood anxiety disorders 
are on an exponential rise. It's the number one reason that children go to the pediatric emergency room. Not musculoskeletal injuries, but mental health issues. Moving together is the way in which you learn to socially negotiate and interact with one another. Not like this. That's an interesting interaction, but not like this. So, in Canada we have guidelines. These are the brand new. You should download them because they're interesting guidelines. I like them a lot, except that they're useless for changing the population. No guideline has made a difference, ever. Are they useful to know? Yes. Are they useful to change behavior? Zero. This is our guidelines now, the 24-hour guidelines that say <laughs> kids should sweat from 5 to 17. They should move around a little bit more by stepping around. They should get good sleep and not sit around so much in front of a device. Cool. And for under five-year-olds, similar thing. Good guidelines, but they're not meaningful to a population because if a parent looks at that, they have no clue what to do doesn't tell you what to do or how to change your behavior in a movement suppressed culture. So guidelines are interesting, but not the solution. This is American data from 2008. It's the number of people in America measured by accelerometry, a real way of knowing whether you're active or not. And interestingly enough, in 2008, the Americans Children under the age of 12 were at 48% activity level, the girls at 34%. There should be no difference between boys and girls, first off, at all, but a failure because it's less than 50%. And then sadly, after puberty, the boys drop a whopping 40 some odd percent to 11%, the girls drop 10 times to 3%, both are tragedies. And then by, by the age of me in the American population, 96% of them are at risk. See that data? 2008. Canada, 2011 to 2014, equaled the Americans in the wrong direction. We were more active than them, but by 2013-14, we were as inactive as them. I've looked at your data. You're eight years behind us. Americans here, Canadians here, Swedes here. You understand what's happening? So physical literacy has now been able to tell us why boys and girls are different in activity levels. I'm going to share that with you. We now understand why. And I'm going to share that. And this is something that all countries in the world are going through. If you're less active and you eat more, obesity happens. That's one thing that happens. In 1972, in Canada, 9% of people were obese. And by now, 29, 30, 31%. America's at 41% right now. Obese, not overweight, obese. And interestingly enough, no government in Canada, see the red and blue, Red is liberal government, blue is conservative governments. Canadians are really good at going red, blue, red, blue, red, blue. We talk, we just switch. That's really intelligent. <laughs> but no government has made a change in that trajectory, ever. And if you ask Canadians whether they're obese or not, see the star? In 2014, we asked Canadians, are you obese or not? That's what they answer. When we measure them, they're way up there. That's called dysfunction. <laughs> that is the trajectory. Here we are now. Those are all the countries. Everybody's sloping the wrong direction. There's not a single country. There's, there are. The 20 most protected countries in the world from obesity are the ones that have no food. Certainly not the solution. <laughs> Remove food from society. But these countries here, there's not a single one protected, nor is Sweden. Your average step rate of your children went in 2013, now from 16,000 steps to 12,000 steps a day. That's measured just recently. So from 1972, Canada's played their first ad on TV. 
to say, we're not fit anymore, we need to get active. And you know what the ad was? You can Google this, and I encourage you to watch it. You're gonna type in Swedish, Canadian, and put the word participation. Participation and action in one word, participation. If you do that, and I'm, I'm not gonna play it for you now, you're gonna see the first ever Canadian ad about saying we should get fit. And you know what it is? I'll show it to you. Actually, Tom, come beside me. We'll actually do it. <laughs> so stand beside me here. So here's the picture. Let's pretend we're running. Okay. It shows me I'm 30 years old, zooms in on my face, running in my tracksuit in 1972. Nice purple tracksuit. And then it goes, here's the 30-year-old 30, 30 Canadian running. The 30-year-old Canadian is just as fit, and it pans over to see the Swedish guy as fit as a 60-year-old Swede. I'm not joking. That was our ad. Canadians love Swedish people. We think you're the greatest. You are. But that was the ad. We compared a Canadian at 30 to the average 60-year-old Swede. Watch it. It's funny. <laughs> Useful to show your kids. Look at Canadians love Swedes. <laughs> this is a really cool slide. Science, knowledge, has shown us that if you're physically inactive, every single one of these arrows is like 15 or 20 studies, even some of them 50 studies, proving, and we rarely use that word in science, proving that if you're physically inactive, it leads to these blue conditions, and every single one of these conditions, which isn't them all, there's 42, are related to physical inactivity, without question. We all know this. You may not know all of them, but we know that if you're physically inactive, your risk of getting any one of those conditions is dramatically increased. But knowing this doesn't change the population. We take our chances. We risk everything. But despite that, this graph right here, what's really interesting is that physical inactivity is related to your mood, to anxiety, to depression. The more physically active you are, the way better mood you have. It is as effective as any drug for depression, and it reduces anxiety dramatically. And if you don't have good mood, depression, or if you have anxiety, they negatively feed back on everything else. Everything else becomes trouble. Any strategy you guys have or you're involved in in sport, mental health and physical health cannot be separated. You cannot have a mental health strategy without physical activity. You can't have a physical activity strategy without mental health. They're one and the same. You're part of this equation, so you have to get with this language. This is some data from my study, and I'm going to start picking up the pace here. See these seven people at the top? This is a cross-section of the femur. The seven people on bottom are 21 years of age. They take 15,000 steps a day. Those are seven different people. They're very hard to find, those people, because they're really active. The top people are all gamers at 21 years of age, 3,000 steps a day or less. Follow me? Really inactive, really active. The range of society. A very active person in a day will put in 50,000 steps. But we say a minimum at that age, 15,000 ish. 12,000 for us. But if you look at this, you can see easily the difference between the bones on the top and the bones on the bottom, right? You don't need to be a scientist. Why well, I show you that? is that those 21-year-olds on the top, it is impossible to recover their bone. There is no drug, there is no exercise you can do to fix those bones. How do I know that? I know that because the astronauts that went to space and didn't exercise enough in the early days came back with those bones and we couldn't repair them. Now they exercise two and a half hours a day because in microgravity you need to do that much. So that's a scary proposition given that the fact that the skeleton grows when you have your growth spurt that much, right? You grow that much. In a very puberty, your skeleton goes 25% of your bone mass is laid down at puberty. 
What's happening to the physical activity? It goes from 40% to 7%. Do you think we have an osteoporosis society, an osteoporosis problem now? Look forward. Here's my first sports slide. Here we go. On the left hand side, in the blue circles, is obesity in Canada. I already showed you that graph. But I want to show you something that I'm very proud of as a Canadian. Back in 1972, we only got four medals at the Olympics, and recently we're at 45. Woohoo! And that's both summer and winter combined. Oh, Canada. Pretty cool, right? Ever increasing Olympic performance. That's nice to see but ever increasing obesity. If I actually plot obesity against metal counts, that's perfect. In science, a 0.92 R squared is like perfect. It's perfect as you get in science. So make more Canadians obese, get more metals? No, doesn't work that way. But when I say that to funny, any Canadian who comes back with a medal around their neck, we don't permit them to say to the public anymore, I'm inspiring Canadians to become active. No, you're not. You're inspiring Canadians to watch you on TV. And I'm not joking. You inspire Olympians, yes. Are you inspiring the population to become active? For 45 years, ever-increasing participation, or ever-increasing Olympic medal count has not resulted in a more active population. You want to dispute that with me? I'd be happy to. I'm pro sport. But we have created the greatest spectator society in the face of the planet. The Men's World Cup had 30 billion views, 64 games. There's 7.4 billion people on the face of the planet. Think about this. I sit down as a Canadian, I, I buy 12 beer and nachos every time I watch a football match. And I sit down for three hours watching the match. I'm gonna do math for you. 30 billion times three hours of sitting divided by 1,194 people, that's all the players in the World Cup and referees moving, times 94 minutes. We set the world record for inactivity. Did we not? I would submit to you that the Olympics are obesogenic. There's 10,000 participants, 7.4 billion people on the face of the planet. You can do the math. Am I pro sport? Absolutely. Balance is necessary. Why do you watch? Well, it's not that you shouldn't watch, it should be balancing it with activity, right? I mean, I'm talking to sport people and my friends here. But we have to be realistic about what we are. Are you responsible for that? I don't know, I'm partially responsible. <laughs> but are we totally? No, that's society's impact. But it's also commercialization of sport. You know, you have to be careful about things. So here we go, physical literacy, what's it about? Maybe it's the missing link, <coughs> who knows? Margaret Whitehead, there she is, British stoic philosopher. She looks like a philosopher, doesn't she? She's a friend, great person. 2001, she wrote a paper on physical literacy, and she's the modern maven of physical literacy. She reconstituted it in the computer era, in the internet era. So we have to give kudos for Margaret for bringing it back, but she didn't invent it. It was 1884. Americans invented the term, sadly, but true. There she is at our International Physical Literacy Conference in Canada. We gave kudos to her. Good, good person, hard, hard philosopher. From the time of Margaret reinstituting the term, we've had four international physical literacy conferences. The first one had 65 people at it, with one scientist. The last one in Toronto had 400 participants and 70 scientists. The next one will be where I live, Winnipeg, Canada. You'll notice that we have elephants because we're in flood season right now, so the elephants come out of the ground and go onto buildings. <laughs> That's not true. We don't have elephants. There's a reason why there's an elephant there. It's sitting on the Human Rights Museum for Canada, and the Human Rights Museum is our partner in this conference because they see physical literacy as a means to create an equitable society. 
That's a big statement from a major place because it'll help have health, health equity and create human development potential. So this is a bigger issue than sport. I'm talking to sport people, but that's cool. We'll have 1,500 delegates and 5,000 children moving at this conference. In Umeo, next year in September, will be the first ever international physical literacy conference in Europe, hosted in Umeå, Sweden. That's an exciting story. Two international physical literacy conferences in one year. From one in 2010 was the first one. Not that long ago, I can even remember. Canada has adopted physical literacy, unbelievably so, but it's still not in the public eye. But every single agency we have, and there's 80 agencies that have adopted it, these are just some of them. Parks and Recreation, Coaching, Sport Canada, all of our banks have adopted the term. Uh, physical Education, Sport, many, many agencies have adopted it. Our long-term athlete development model, which you'll see is very similar to yours, because we all have similar ones nowadays, has at the foundation, this is the Canadian long-term athlete development model. We have a new one coming out, we all, I know yours. <laughs> But why I show you this is that it says that if you develop physical literacy in children, they can do whatever they want in life. Cool. Do I believe in that? Sure. But physical literacy is for life, not just for young people. So we've changed this diagram. It comes out May 15th this year. It doesn't look like that anymore. I'll give you, I'll, I'll give you some hints. It took first contact and awareness and goes all the way up the side because you can join hockey at any age. Makes sense, right? And it changes a few more diagrams there, but the concept is still the same. But one thing you haven't seen is this graph. You'll also see this one coming out, and this was really useful in sport. This is taking the long-term athlete development model and flipping it on its side and saying, what is it that people actually get into when they get into a sport? I'll talk you through this one. On the left-hand side is when you're deciding to get into sport. I want to get in. Umio just created a brand new gymnastics facility, Swenska Gymnastics. That's really cool. 250,000 members. 2% of the entire population is in gymnastics. 8% of all children. Wow, it's almost the best in the world. But there's a two-year waiting list already and it just opened. Oh wow, huge demand. So interestingly enough, before you even enter into the first time, you're out. You see that? You exit before you actually enter. But that helps us in sport understand an exit strategy at the point of first contact awareness. We never think about that, but we should. And your exit before you even can get into the sport has already happened. As opposed to exiting after the first contact in red all the way through, because really all sport is in a simplistic way is a competency progression, isn't it? Every single sport is a competency progression. There is no exceptions. A technical, tactical competency progression. You can decide, you always enter over there and you progress that way. Blue is the best there is. Where do you want to go to? I want to go to yellow and hang out. Cool. Oh, you want to go to the top of the world? Go blue. But interesting enough, exiting over here is very different after you start participation than exiting elsewhere. We now use this to understand why people enter sport and why people exit sport. Now this is interesting because now, let's just say, and Swedish Gymnastics is in this trouble right now, they got 50,000 parkour members, 300-ish in rhythmic gymnastics, 4,000-ish in artistic gymnastics, and they have no model by which people should go from one to another to another. That's a nice problem to have. But you can now think about this, if you draw this diagram and say, hey, if I was in this sport and I exit at either entry 
or after participation, I can go here. That's going from one competency progression to another competency progression, from one quest to another quest. Why am I saying that to you? It's not if somebody drops out of basketball, who cares? It's where are you going next? Huh? We in sport have not figured out a flow model between the silos that we have. And this becomes critical to start talking about when we really start talking about retention of people in sport. You have to have a model and you have to have a negotiation. And this is vital for a whole bunch of different reasons for sports welfare, to have models that can explain that. This is, uh, there's hundred, I've got, we now have like 20 or 30 of these, and I'll give you an example. Imagine three of these stacked up on top of each other. That's triathlon. Running competency, swimming competency, biking competency, yeah? But you could be a runner entering into that. That's a different pathway than if you're a cyclist. Do you follow me on this? You could be a professional cyclist and turn into a triathlete, but that's a different pathway. But we don't think that way quite yet. This model might help us out. Canada has a physical literacy consensus statement. We're the only one in the world by consensus that says that's a statement. You can Google it and download it. It's two pages. There it is. So I'm not going to read it to you because I'm going to explain it to you, make you feel it. Google Canada's physical literacy consensus statement. 9,000 people voted for it. I voted against it, just so you know. Doesn't mean I don't believe in it. I, I would change the wording a little bit, but not much. The Americans, two weeks later, came out with their Physical Literacy Act uh, plan. And a Canadian wrote it for them. But they said they wrote it. But that's OK, because that's what Americans do. They steal Canadian technology and call it their own. I'm joking. They have a strategy. You can download that one, too. It's very American. This is an important statement. UNESCO, the United Nations people, say that literacy, reading and writing, is an essential skill for all ages, and it's indispensable to participate in this world. Do you agree that reading and writing is indispensable? Yeah? Everybody should read and write. OK. That, did you need science for that? No? OK. Let me, let me be convincing. Physical literacy is crucial to the acquisition of every child, youth, and adult, and it's an essential life skill to actively participate in this world. Done, thank you very much. Don't need to do science. If you believe in that, go forward. Oh, what is physical literacy, Dean? Well, reading and writing is the ability to, is a skill, isn't it? Reading and writing is a skill. Well, movement is a skill. Let's think about it that way. Now let's go to some interesting quotes. You could read those quickly. Generally agree with those, yeah? You may not agree with God or whatever, based on your religious backgrounds. But do you kind of agree with those? More or less, yeah? Watch this. That's when those are stated. We've known the problem all along. Mechanization, computerization, internetization. That's a new word. <laughs> We've had a f have we known physical literacy for a long time. Here's the basics, guys. If you believe in ABCs, if you know your ABCs, only then can you make a word, and only then can you make a sentence, and only then can you write your mama birthday card. Right? If you can't write your mama birthday card, you're in trouble. I write my birthday card every single year. She lives with me. I open it up, because that's creepy, I know, but that's OK. And so I write my mom a birthday card. I give it to her. She opens it up. She's Dutch. And she actually reads it. And she cries, happy. Then she closes the card. And like a good Dutch mother, she says to me, Dien Tag, that is a very nice card, but not yet grammatically correct. <laughs> then I cry. But a wonderful thing. If you don't know numbers, ABCs, or one, two, threes, you can't do fractions, equations, and you certainly won't go to engineering school, and then you won't jump from space funded by Red Bull. 
every Swedish child should jump from space funded by Red Bull, or yeah. Every Swedish child should play hockey. Every Swedish child should try to beat the Canadians in curling. Oh, you did beat us recently. <laughs> no, every single child should be equipped with the literacies they need to choose what they want to do. If that's true, and if you accepted what I just said to you, every Swedish child should have literacy, numeracy, and physical literacy. It's not a discussion, actually. I want to equip children with physical literacy and the other literacies so they can say, the world's my oyster, let me pick what I want to do. Not to feed them down one specific pathway, but physical literacy is no different. The ABCs and one, two, threes of physical literacy are movement skills. Not basic movement skills, not sports-specific skills, general life movement skills. And then you can put them together to make tasks like the pas de Shaw from Swan Lake. Very difficult to do with four ballerinas. Or chopping wood. That's a physical skill. Changing a light bulb standing on a chair is a physical skill. That's not so simple. The number one place where people drown in Canada and the world in man-made places is Man-made places of water, the number one place where people drown in the world is the bathtub. Not a swimming pool, not a hot tub, but the bathtub. Who's teaching the competency to get in and out of the bathtub? That's a competency. Matter of fact, Swedish people value swimming almost better than any other country in the world because if you know, if you have competency to swim, you don't drown. Your drowning rates are one-sixth of the drowning rates of Canada. We do not have mandatory swimming. Mm -hmm. Competency protects against drowning. Not fitness, not physical activity. Competency in movement. Have you ever seen this Danish product? You have it here in Sweden? Yeah. It just came to Canada. <laughs> I'll be in Copenhagen tomorrow at the airport going through the Lego store. Actually will be because I'll be taking a picture, a video of all the Lego in that store. And if you've been to a Lego store lately, what do you notice? There are no more free pails of Lego. They're all 500 Lego kits that are paint by number. This is how you put it together. Yeah? But Interesting enough, if you think about Lego for a second, and each one of those build, each one of those blocks is a movement skill. Think about each one as a movement skill. You only got four Lego blocks, four movement skills. What can you make? Not much. Is that a good gift to give to a five-year-old? That's actually mean. What if you had that many movement skills? What could you do? Oh, not bad. That many? No. Every Swedish kid should have that many movement skills for land, air, ice, snow, water. Then you're equipped to choose what you want to do. Who delivers that? Sport, recreation, physical education, early childhood educators. What's it called, your after school program? Free kids. Yeah, that too. That's very hard for me to say. But most kids don't look like that, they look like this, right? That's not creativity, folks. Is it? Is that creativity? If a kid's given that me, is that creativity? No, it's not. You know what's interesting? You almost can't buy that Lego kit anymore. And you know what made me really sick? They had to actually say, giving me a bunch of freeform box, ideas included. It almost made me vomit. But you know what's really interesting on that slide? Lego's got it right. After you're 99, you can't be creative. <laughs> and under 40, you choke on the bits of creativity. Makes sense. But movement's kind of like that, too. If you don't have a le le Lego box, how can you be creative in what you're about to do? We wrote a paper, you can read it at some time, about the critical considerations of physical literacy for your sector sport for recreation, public health, and education. When was this written? 2017. About a decade ago, there were 16 papers on physical literacy. Today, there's 180. I have now one paper a week 
accepted as a researcher on physical literacy. A week. I'll have about 25 papers out this year on physical literacy. That's cool. But physical literacy is not so much science. It is. We do science. It's a social evolution. Interesting problem to have as a scientist. What this paper said, it's here in pillars. Every single person should have competency in movement. And you should have competency in different contexts. Land, air, ice, snow, water, indoor, outdoor. Oh, there's another context. I'm in front of an audience right now. Am I not? This is a social context. Do sport people participate in front of audiences? Yeah. Performance arts people perform for audiences. But we both have audiences. How do you prepare your athletes to perform in front of another person or an audience? I would argue you must. If you do quality sport, which means you do quality physical literacy experiences, you must prepare all participants for presenting themselves in front of others, whether it's a passive audience or active. If you're not doing that, I would argue you're not doing quality sport. The journey means that physical literacy goes from 0 to 112 years of age. Power means, and this is a big one, if everybody was physically literate, what would the world be like? We wouldn't have health problems, as many as we do now, right? That's called health equity. And girls wouldn't pop their ACL six times more frequently than males. In Sweden, in Canada, the United States, in soccer and basketball, females pop their anterior cruciate ligament six times to every one boy. We now know because of physical literacy why that is. It has nothing to do with strength. It has nothing to do with hip angles. It has nothing to do with the menstrual cycle. It has everything to do with the fact that sport, recreation, and physical education does not provide the movement competence to girls at an equal level to the boys, despite the fact that they should, resulting in different ability to cut right and cut left in girls and lower proficiency. When you fix that, 6 to 1 goes to 1.5 to 1. So four of those injuries are from gender mistreatment. You felt that? That's safety, isn't it? Not due to, uh, and I'll show you that data so you can understand that data. That's power. This is what physical literacy is right here. I'll, this is a good diagram. If you have movement skills, movement vocabulary, or movement repertoire, that's not simply physical literacy. Giving people movement skills is not physical literacy. Physical literacy is, when you give them movement skills, you also give them comprehension, confidence, motivation, and enjoyment. You also give them awareness, the ability to select movements when they need to select the movements, the ability to sequence those movements together and modify those movements for different circumstances, social or physical. And you create symmetry from right and left sides so that they're symmetrical in their movement patterns. And you make sure that they can do all sorts of movements in every single environment that there is. Land, air, ice, snow, and water. If you're in Jamaica, don't have to deal with snow unless you come to America to train for bobsleigh. You follow me on this? And you help people with the social environment. If you do all of that over there, that outspits physical literacy. If you're physically literate, you can choose whatever activity that you want to do. Physical activity is not physical literacy. Doing what Tom and Dee did earlier on, the Swedish-Canadian ad, running is physical proficiency, not physical literacy. A child that goes in at age five in Canada and has 365 days a year of hockey for his entire life to 20 years of age, that's physical proficiency, not physical literacy. Two completely different concepts. If you like the activity and you are motivated to participate, and only after you participate do you get fitness, right? You can't get fitness overnight. But fitness isn't just physical fitness, it's mental fitness and social fitness. Or well-being. You don't like the word fitness? Replace fitness with well-being. Isn't that what we want for everybody? 
This is it as a simple slide. This is the most important slide today. This is the physical literacy cycle. If we give kids movement at adults, movement competence, and at the same time you develop confidence in them, and how do you do that? They will be motivated to continue participating. This cartoon is evidenced in science. It's a cartoon, but it's evidence. Every one of those arrows has evidence and is based on good theory. And it says that when you're making people participate in sport, recreation, or other leisure time pursuits, you had better provide them with social connection and enjoyment. Because the number one and number two reasons people stay in sport, anybody know? Fun and friendship. Coaches need to know how to create fun. Who's teaching that? Not what you think is fun, but the participant's view of fun. And what's social connection like? What do you mean by that? We'll talk more, but that, that makes sense. Because you know what? If you create this cycle, then this doesn't happen, right? You don't get all these 42 diseases. You don't pop your knee. It takes a community to raise a physically literate child. Sport is only one part of that. You need recreation on site, you need healthcare on site, you need government, immigration, the military, vocation. Everybody needs to be there. And you need to make sure all your coaches are trained correctly. You need to make sure all your programs are physical literacy enriched and quality sport. You need to make sure that all your facilities are inclusive of all levels of ability. The sports system in Canada right now is the greatest filter on the face of the planet. We throw away people like no tomorrow. You're a late bloomer, you're not welcome in sport because we identify early bloomers and keep you. So 30% of people that are late bloomers, we kind of say, hey, I know you might have been the best Olympic athlete we ever found, but we're not gonna find you. You felt that. Inclusion would say we have pathways for all levels of ability. We're not quite there yet. But we want to be. Need a little money. Look, physical literacy is a journey. It's not a destination. None of you have the same Lego blocks. The circus people, I say to them, physical literacy is a journey, not a destination. Everybody goes, oh, that's so sweet. But if I'm with circus people, you know what I do? Physical literacy is a journey, not a destination. Then I say, if there ever was a destination, it's circus. <laughs> they like that. They go, aw, Dean, that's hot. <laughs> but you see why I say this? It's a journey. And my daughter, this is her, it's not really, but she went along her physical literacy journey. And at 16, she was a competitive dancer. I might go out of frame here, excuse me. She was a competitive dancer. And at 16, she quit dance. So I sat her down in front of me, just like this. Said, Allie, I loved putting buns in ballet hair and putting false eyelashes on people without gluing their eyes shut. And I loved stitching on ribbons onto point shoes when they ripped. That was my physical literacy journey as a dance dad. And you've now removed that from me. I said to her, why did you leave? All my two friends left the dance studio. So I don't have to pay $7,000 a year anymore and make 11 outfits for your dance recitals? No, this is great. Did you enjoy dance? Yes, I did. As a physical literacy expert that I am, I sat across from her and this is the point about this slide. Where do you want to go next? And she said, I want to be gym fit. I said, okay. We went and bought a Lululemon outfit and went to the gym and trained her all about the gym. And she got gym fit for a couple of years. She quit. And I said, where do you want to go next? I want to play ultimate. I said, cool. And then a year later, she thought it was a cult. So she left. She called it cultimate. <laughs> and then she went back to the roots that my family had, which we did when she was a child, which is outdoor recreation. What did I do as a dad? I helped her 
manage her physical literacy journey. If you are different sports and represent different sports here, how are we doing that? If somebody leaves basketball, where are you going next? I said that already. We need to see ourselves as physical literacy journey managers. Do you, do you feel that? How do you do that? It's complicated because your databases have to be connected. It's possible. So in the end of the day, this is my hometown city. How am I doing? Good. This is my hometown city, Winnipeg. Please come. And I'll tell you why. For two weeks of the entire year, just a few weeks ago, we have glare ice everywhere. And the interesting thing about that, kind of like Umyo, for two weeks. This is real data from March 17, 2017. 109 people in my city fell on that ice and broke their hip or their wrist. The next day on the 18th, 130 people did. If you are my age and above, I'm 57, but call me 60. At 60 years of age and above, if you fall and break your hip, whether you're in Sweden, Canada, United States, 20% of those people will die within a year. Now you can do the math. There's 239 people who fractured in two days. Not all of them were hips, I grant you that. But this is one year later. There are now 40 people less. From Now I'm pretty sure, do you guys have this? I'm pretty sure you do because I've seen you with your colors. You have that big sheet of ice, kind of like that, and you paint targets on the end of them. You see that? And you have rocks and you go, you seen it, yeah? Yeah. And you go, hurry hard! Yeah? You do that here in Sweden, yeah? Why I say that to you is that to me when I see that, I'm not afraid of that. I see it as a sheet of ice that I like to slide on. Because I'm a competent mover on ice, personally. There's 800,000 people in Canada that curl. 800,000. 90% of the world's curlers are in Canada. 70% of all curlers are over 50. And they curl three to four times a week. And when they get out of their Volvos, they walk through an icy parking lot into a building and they stay on ice all the time. They leave the building over an icy parking lot, go back in their car, drive home over an icy surface, back into their icy stairs, into their house and they don't break their hips. That's called confident, competent movement patterns, resulting in no fractures, even in people that are 60. Way to go, sport. Curling saves lives. We don't sell that, but we should. Every single, now watch how I'm saying this, every single one of those hip fractures is preventable. Yes or no? By producing competent, confident movers on ice. <coughs> okay, 99%. 95? Doesn't matter. Almost all of them are. That's physical literacy. That's the benefit of curling to society. That's not scary, that's a curling rink. Huh? And you know what curlers do? They're crazy. They make you, whoops. They make you put one of those, they make one foot really slippery and the other foot okay. Please, next time you see an elderly person walking on a street, go, hey, let me help you. Put one shoe slippery. Well, that, that's a joke, but you know what I'm getting at. There's the elderly curling. You don't phone the police and saying, danger, danger, hip fractures. But you know what? In schools in Manitoba, you know what they do? Kids are playing on a playground, they'll put a pile on over any ice during the playground. The only way you get better walking on ice is moving on ice. What do you do? Oh, you want hip fractures later on. Way to go. I'm not gonna show you that data. Here's two weeks earlier. Come to Manitoba. That's real. March 8th, two weeks prior to the ice. That's our snow. It's fun. But the next day after you get that, you have to do this. And as a result of doing that, 37 people came to my hospital with heart attacks. 
14 of them died. And 125 people went to the physiotherapist because they hurt their back shoveling. Why is this relevant? All 125 injuries are preventable by good form and te technique. Competent, confident movers of shovel. That's physical literacy. I'd say 11 of the 14 deaths are preventable by physical literacy as well. So physical literacy is bigger than creating sporting excellence and sporting participation. It's about life. And I tied the, that one to curling. That's the data, I'm not gonna show you it. This is the big concept, durability. This is brand new, this comes from physical literacy, and this is huge for sport. What do you do in sport? I create durable people. Do you want durable kids? I want durable genes. Durable means you're gonna last a long time. Durability is a really good word, why? It means the ability to endure, the ability to participate. Whether you're in training, life, or what have you, and the nice thing about durability, it includes mental and physical characteristics. And you know what? The word durability is a positive word. Is, it, is there a Swedish word for durability? Doesn't wear out. Okay. It does not wear out. Well, I want that for everybody because positively framed, why am I saying this? In Canada, for five years we've been saying Fall prevention programs are necessary in society to stop those hip fractures. Well, that's fear mongering. Have you ever seen uh, judo? Fall preventions for judo. <laughs> Stupid. You snowboard, you fall. Falling's fun. Not to be afraid of, because if you're afraid of falling and not going on ice, you stay in your house for six months in Canada. That's not good. So to me, durability is something we produce in sport by making people do all of these things in the right way. Therefore, they last a long time and don't break down. We've created a new program called Movement Preparation, which I'm not teaching about today, but we filmed, and we get you that film. It's a new thing that is designed to improve durability, and it's a component of training in sport that enhances performance and durability. The movement, you can download the movement preparation guide we did 10 years ago in Canada at physicalliteracy.ca. That's the old one, but the new one exists as well. And Tom actually has, I did it in Umeo, and he videotaped the whole thing, he's going to give it to you and all the resources. Movement preparation is a physical literacy concept that enhances performance and durability based on well-established scientific principles or theories. And it's different than a warm-up, and this is very useful. <laughs> a warm-up 30 years ago, go break a sweat on the bike. That's what we'd say, break a sweat. And then you go do your training or your competition. Everybody got that? That's old school warm-up. You okay? Oh, no, no, I just wanted to make sure, okay. <laughs> If you're going to cry or anything like that. <laughs> too much. I was right. No, not too much. Okay. <laughs> Bring me back some tissue. Anyway. Warm up. And you know what the world did after that? They said, warming up your body physically warm isn't good enough for getting ready for training or competition. We have to prepare the brain, too. Brain and muscle. So we created the phrase, dynamic warm up. And as far as I know, there's nothing about sport or anything that's not dynamic, so it's a weird phrase. But what dynamic warm-up meant was we're going to prepare the brain and the muscles to get ready to train or compete. That's all it meant. Neuromuscular preparation. Do I agree? 100%. Now the next thing. What's movement preparation? Movement preparation says, if I do this today, this training stuff, kind of like a modified dynamic warm-up but physical literacy enriched, and then I do it the next training session and the next training session, let's just say three times a week. Every single time I do it, my brain is improving in my ability to control movement. I'm learning. And then if that happens over a certain period of time, the brain's ability to control the body's movement improves. Therefore, you have higher performance and lower injury rates. 
The evidence on this is solid. That's very different than thinking about warm-up for today. I'm about to train or compete. It's about thinking about <laughs> using warm-up to get accumulative benefits so you improve people over time. That's the difference. And so now we have the fancy version of it that's released that replaces that booklet. And this is one piece of it. This is called Physical Literacy Enriched Core. So I work at the circus industry, both at Circus Today and the National Circus School at Cole National Le Cirque. And I design all the core training programs. And if you've seen us in the circus world, there's nobody who touches us in core. We have level one to 14. I don't even want to tell you 14, it'll make you sick. Maybe I'll tell you. This would be sitting with a one arm like this in a chin up position, my body's off the ground, taking and doing a V set 45 times like that with the one arm and then switching to the other arm and doing 45. That's level 14. That's real, by the way. You're going, nobody can do that. Oh, yeah. Can you imagine doing 45 V sets like that and you're not even supported? Nothing on your back with a one arm chin up? Imagine it. It's almost unimaginable. Level 8 is sick. 14 is wrong. This is 1 to 3. I went to my boss at Circus Life. Can I release this? He said, absolutely not. I said, can I leak it? He said, sure. <laughs> 50,000 downloads a week. It's level 1, level 2, level 3 core. It's physical literacy enriched core. Do I have enough time to do one core with you? Yes. Yeah, OK. Anybody who wants to do a little bit of core with me, maybe 10 of you, if you all want to, come down here right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on. And we're going to do level one core. You'll be fun. Well, you'll love this. Come on down, right up here. There's carpet and everything. Lots of space. Don't knock over the microphone. Yeah, this will be so much fun. Yeah, go on your bellies. Go on your bellies. Okay, you guys ready? If you've been in the strength and conditioning world, which I am too, so I'm part of the Canadian Society of Exercise Physiology, which is like the American College of Sports Medicine, we're the exercise professionals of the world in Canada, and we learn about strength and conditioning, which means we learn about muscle strength, muscle endurance, body composition, flexibility, and cardiovascular fitness. We're good at that. We're excellent at doing front squats. In the end of the day, I can have a person do a two minute front plank. And you know what happens? Every single person at one minute, their veins pop out the side of their neck. <laughs> and then at about a minute and a half, your eyes turn into lasers and want to cut me in half. I don't know of any activity in the world that is a two minute front plank. I'm not saying it's a bad idea. It certainly develops strength and endurance. But there's nothing we do in circus that's two minutes stationary. Oh, she's back after crying. <laughs> Did you have a good cry? Yeah, it's excellent. Thank uh, you. Uh, okay, good. Sorry. My doctor says, you always cry in the shower because then your tears are like this. <laughs> Makes me feel happy. You guys ready? So I'm not going to do two minute front planking. And by the way, I use level one core in grade five. I'm oh, sorry, in, with five year olds. If you're a first timer at the circus, with a high performance background in circus, you get level one. And I treat you as if you're a five-year-old. I've seen many kindergarten schools, which is five years old in Canada, using these core routines. That's where it should be, kindergarten. But it happens to be high performance, but it's not. So you guys ready? Physical literacy enriched exercise, which is what this is, is very different than a two minute front plank. How is it different? It's not about training muscles, it's about training your brain. You guys ready? Because I want my body to be able to control itself while my limbs move. It's called sport. Okay, ready? Front plank. Go on, go on. Show me front plank. Oh, that's beautiful. And belly down. Belly down. Relax. Oh, yeah, we don't do two minutes. So, <laughs> the next thing we do, that's cool. Nothing wrong with that. I'm going to have you put your hands wider apart and you put it down like that, one hand up. I don't really care. In circuits, it's cool. And if you want to slump, like you are now, like a seal, or you want to be a camel, I'm good with either. There is no reason on the face of the planet that I need you to be perfect straight, unless I have an aesthetic reason for that. 
Why on earth do you need to be straight? You want to be straight because you want to look like a two by four. <laughs> That's cool, nothing wrong with that. So we'll try to be straight. If you want to be a seal though, go ahead. If you want to be a camel, go ahead. I'm not going to crack that because it's not unsafe. But otherwise you couldn't sit like the position that you're in. So, and if you're a physio in this room, you better listen carefully. So, front plank, ready? Go for it, plank it up. And go, watch me, up, up, down, down, up, up, down, down, up, up, down, down, up, up, down, down, belly down. Oh, we are, oh, jeez, everybody was smiling and having fun. Was that part of physical literacy? Enjoy it. They're all looking at each other, social connection, check, competency, getting there, confidence, uh, maybe. Motivation, definitely, that was fun. So the next thing we're going to do, there's a little dog in, called a Vigeon Frise. It's got beautiful silky white hair. It's about that big. It's got a little button pink nose. And everybody's got one in front of them. And it's sitting in front of you. And it loves its nose being cuddled, tickled. And it's been trained by Caesar Milan, the dog whisperer, so it can't bite. And it's virtual, so it can't actually bite. So it's in front of you. So what you're gonna do is move your legs apart a little bit, go into a front plank, shift your weight to one arm, and you're gonna to point to that pretty dog's nose and you're gonna tickle it as heartily as you can, okay? You guys ready? And front plank, shift your weight, shift right arm out, and tickle, 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 and other arm. Tickle, 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 and other arm. And tickle, 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 and belly down. Amazing dog ticklers. The next one, you can be either, because in Canada we're sex and gender neutral, when we need to be, you can be, any of you, Superman or Superwoman. I don't need to know which one you pick. You can pretend to be either or one, change fluidly at one moment to the next. But here's what I'm going to say to you. When I watch Superman or Supergirl on TV, they kind of fly like this. And I hear that sound with their cape flapping in the wind. And then they switch to the other side. You got that? So you're going to actually go front plank, not yet, right arm pointer, left foot off. Okay? Ready? And front plank, right arm pointer, left foot off. Oh, and switch. And switch. And belly down. Good. Hey, I'm beginning to see that if I did that enough, the brain would be able to control my trunk while the body is being perturbed. That's brain training. That's what happens in sport, isn't it? Not two minutes of, mm. that's good. But watch this now. Ready, front plank. Up, up, down, down. Up, up, down, down. Up, up, down, down. Belly down. Now watch this. All of you were going up with one arm, and then the second arm was following. You follow me? There was a lead arm. I'm going to say up, up, down, down, up, up, down, down. You're going to do it the regular way. Then you're going to go switch, and you're going to go the opposite way. You guys ready? Front plank. Up, up, down, down. Up. Oh, I didn't say up. Up. <laughs> up, down, down. And switch. Up, up, down, down. Up, up, down, down. Belly down. You have all noticed that you're asymmetrical. Pushing off with one arm is an important thing in life, as is pushing off with the other arm. You all recognize you're asymmetrical pretty much. Therefore, you know you've self-monitored that. I don't need to tell you as a coach, you're going to fix that. I guarantee you'll fix that. Because if I'm doing this routine with you, I'm going to go up, up, down, down, up, up, down, down, up, up, down, down, switch. You'll know what I mean next time, and you'll go to the opposite side, and you'll try to make it symmetrical because you're perfectionists. Make sense? If I did all four of the planks that we just did for 30 seconds in a row, it would be two minutes, and you almost all were smiling planking. Do you follow me on this? So there's some psychology involved. Let's go side plank. Quick, 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 side plank. Nice. Yeah. Hand up in the sky, really high. Make it a ballet hand or a jazz hand, whatever that means in school. Don't know. Bend your elbow 90 degrees, make a fist, make an angry, really angry fist, and put that fist where your other elbow is and roll over to the other side plank. Holy cow! 
Hand up to the sky, bend your elbow 90 degrees. Snap, roll over, roll over. Hand to the sky, bend your elbow 90 degrees. Snap, roll over. Hand to the sky, bend your elbow 90 degrees. Snap, roll over. There we go, and stop. You're noticing I'm pushing the speed at which you're doing that by my verbal cueing, which makes you overreact, so you control your trunk in space. You follow? So the next thing you're going to do is when you're on the side plank, you're going to go heel to sky and down, heel to sky and down. Not toe to sky and down. That's iliosoas. Everybody ready? Side plank. Hands to the sky. Heel to sky and down. Heel to sky and down. Snap roll over. Heel to sky and down. Heel to sky and down. Snap roll over. And belly down. Now, anybody watching this room is clearly seeing that the gluteus medius on either side is not symmetrical in any way, shape, or form. Gluteus medius is the muscle that supports your trunk and your support. It also is the muscle that targets your foot when you plant to the ground. Gluteus medius is not only a support muscle, but it's a muscle that's used to target the foot to plant. If it operates poorly or is fatigued, pop. Not a good thing. They now are aware when they were lifting up their leg that they're not symmetrical right to left for that gluteus medius, but you need to be. So now I'm going to do a level three move. So instead of putting your hand, your elbow down on the side plank, you put your hand down. Okay? Go for it. Side plank, hand down. Nice. Hand down. Well, if you, do, if you guys want to, you want to do that. Uh -huh. Oh, no, that's okay. What can I Oh, nice. This is tough. Oh, guys are pretty good. Now put your foot to the sky. <laughs> That's a starfish. And stop. Take, take it easy. Okay. In Manitoba, what do you call them? A, a bull. A shoe? Shoe. Shoe? <laughs> Whatever. Bull. You guys ready? You're going to go starfish, like you just did. Then I'm going to say bull, like a cow. And then you're going to go starfish, by the way. Got it? So, starfish? <laughs> Cow. Starfish. Cow. Starfish. Cow. Starfish. There we go. I saw. Good, good, good. Are you feeling some level of control requirements? Is that a more serious score? Level three, and every this document can be downloaded. If you click on this, click, click, it's a video of the person. Level three, actually, is your starfish. You push off of here and land on here. If you do all of the 10 exercises in a row for 30 seconds without bellying down, that's level one. But you start like this. If you do five minutes, it takes five minutes to do the whole thing. You do five minutes a day, you go to level one to level three in a month and a half. That's sick and wrong. And that's only level three of 14. Zero equipment, brain training at the same time as muscle training. You can feel that. You're sweating. There's many other exercises here. I'm not going to explain them to you. They are progressive. And what counts is this is physical literacy enriched exercise. It's a w different way of thinking than strict strength and conditioning thinking. And that's the magic of it. This is just an example, not the end of the road. Are those perfect sequences? No, but they work in the circus industry, which is the most demanding core in the world. So they've got some track. Are they perfect? If you're a chef, you modify. Like if you're doing synchronized swimming, Oh, let's do staying alive while you're doing the core. They'll like that. Whatever you want to do, modify. But it, there's no perfect form here. If you're a chef, you modify the recipe. If you want to be a cook, follow the recipe. Everybody good with this? So now back to the round of applause. That was amazing. I've got my eye on some people here for circus. <laughs> I'll finish on this. I didn't do the gender gap study, uh, but I want to show you a recent study we did to show that quality sport works. 
very few people in the world have seen this. This is going into a report to Sport Canada next week. So my Minister of Sport hasn't even seen it yet. So it's cool. Swedish people before Canadians. Always a good one. If you look at this, there's 18 different movement skills that all of you can identify with. Run a square, which is like cutting, right? It's a little bit bigger than that. There's throwing, catching, skipping, hop, jumping, hop, you know, stuff like that. Those are land-based movement skills, right? Almost everybody kind of understands those. So I measure those in 14,000 Canadian kids. In this case, it's a study. So this is an entire town of grade four children. All grade four children in an entire town. And in Canada, our phys ed curriculum says that all children by grade four will have entry level competency, not perfect, in all of those 18 movement skills. Which on that graph is at 50. You'll notice that the higher the number, the better they're at. The lower the number, they're not so good. 50 is the minimum. Are we reaching 50? Girls, oh, not a single one of the 18 movements are they reaching that value. They have no Lego blocks. Boys, on that side, hey, on average, they're better. Nobody can do the purple one, which is crossovers, which is this at that age, because nobody showed them it. Got that. All you need to do is show it to them and you get it. But if you look at this, boys are better than girls on average. You can see that? It's statistically significant and different. I'm not going to talk too much about that at this moment, but I'm going to say this to you. We gave soccer coaches, football coaches for you, really high quality physical literacy training, and we gave them the movement preparation program to run for 14 weeks. One was a high quality coach who knew what they were doing. We took half of the kids in an entire town, put them into developmental soccer, we'll call it. And the other half was a parent who knew nothing about soccer, and they ran along like bees, swarming for the 14 weeks, or whatever they did. Didn't control that. But it was a parent without quality sport experience and coaching. Follow me? Here's 14 weeks later. And now we shuffle the kids, same graph, same with everything like that. We now shuffle the kids into the ones who went into recreational soccer, we'll call it, which I'll call non-quality sport, and then quality sport. Same axis, same skills. You ready? Quality sport, non-quality sport. Not a change in movement skill capacity in the other group at all. Movement without purpose. Movement, but no purpose. The other side, notice the average is almost 50. It replaced the physical education system. That's an impressive success. I like that. As I sport can produce improved competence in fundamental movement skills, uh, yeah. And not a good thing, people say. I think that's a good thing for sport. Now, if you focus on movement skills and you give the kids adequate repetition, it's a no-brainer that they should improve in movement skills. But oddly enough, we have almost no evidence that that occurs. But now we do. That's good to know because people have more confidence in movement, they're generally better on the field of play, right? So if you actually look at this, you see the one, the one that says run a square? show you quickly here. This is 15,773 Canadian children. Those are the 18 movement skills that we measured. When boys are better than girls, the bars are that way. When girls are better than boys, the bars are that way. Boys have 14 Lego blocks, girls have one. You'll notice one of them at the very bottom is called run square. That's cutting. Girls at age eight are way behind the boys not because they're girls, but because we mistreat them and not giving them adequate time to develop their competence, resulting in an inability to cut at age eight, which then magnifies over time, resulting in, in fact, a 
rupture their ACL six times more frequently than boys. When we fix that competency, the injury rate goes from six to one to 1.5 to one. By giving them movement competence and cutting. By doing movement preparation. Multiple studies demonstrate. Not strength, not endurance. It's the fact that we don't deliver movement competence to girls at the same level as boys. <coughs> In Canadian society, American society, I suspect here because your ACL injury rates are identical. So that means that's gender mistreatment. <coughs> We need to fix that. It's not a sports problem, it's society's problem. I'm going to finish on that because it's a lot to digest. But hopefully you'll get a much better feel now of what physical literacy really is and what it might mean for sport. You can develop physical literacy, you get better sporting excellence and more sports participation. That's the trick. So I'm going to stop there for right now and thank you very much for your attention. Yes, no, no, that's the idea. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Att vi behöver tre typer av ledare. Vi har satt någon namn på dem så här bara för att vi känner att vi behöver det. Eh. Och uppfattning är rörelsekoordinatorer. Det är mer de här projektledartyperna som ska hålla ordning på projekten. Men vi kanske inte kunna övningen så här detalj och lära ut dem. Men kan det här i princip och liksom säljer konceptet. Duktiga på det. Rörelseinstruktören, det är de här som ska utbilda alla aktivitetsdelar och pedagoger. Det behöver vi, för vi ska ju göra oss av med din så fort som möjligt. Han har en hel värld att förändra. Så det är många som drar slit i honom. Vi, eh, så vi håller på att utbilda, ska utbilda egna utbildare. Vi kallar dem för rörelseinstruktörer. Och de ska då utbilda de här som har hand om, i alla fall de barn och unga. Och stötta dem på vägen. Eh, och sen så, ja, de här som då får utbildning i det här och börjar bli kompetenta och vilja att leverera physical literacy and rich activities. De är då rörelse coacher. Det är så vi tänkte strukturera upp det. Och de utbildningarna då som vi känner att de, man behöver i sig det är några typer av utbildningar. Det här som ni har fått idag, ni har fått PL101. De här bokstavskoderna, det där kanadensiska systemet, vi har valt att behålla det bara för att vi samarbetar ju med dem och det är lättare att kommunicera så. Och det finns mycket material där ute, man är intresserad så bör man kika gärna på vad gör de där fysikalitrosin.ca, då känner man igen sig. Eh, det här fick ni idag, den introduktion, och den har vi lärt oss, den kan man göra på lite olika sätt på, på vilken målgrupp den är. Om det är i yrkesverksamma inom idrotten som ni, eller om det är ideella ledare, eller om det är eh, andra typer av tjänstepersoner i andra sektorer. Två lättan, ja. Det är för projektledargänget och rörelsekoordinatorerna då, som behöver lära sig lite grann. Hur ska vi mäta effekterna på det här och sådana saker? Sen är det här, det här är ju viktiga delen. Trenlätta, hur skapar de aktiviteterna? Hur gör vi de här Physical Literacy Enriched Activities? Eh, och där tänker vi oss till att börja med fyra steg. A, B, C, D. Så har ni kört en timme till har ni fått A. Då har ni fått smaka på, på, lite mer på djupet. Hur, man, hur gör man det i praktiken på olika sätt då? Och här, här vill vi bara skapa lite bytan. Här har de gjort väldigt mycket program som är jättespännande. För olika eh, grupper, olika åldrar med olika inriktningar. Cirkustema speciellt tycker jag verkar väldigt spännande. Eh, så vi har börjat sätta en lite där utbildningsschema 1.0 verkligen. För att börja med någonting. Där vi ser vilka typer av utbildningar vi behöver leverera. Eh, så och... Eh, vi ska inte gå igenom det här i detalj, men det finns en plan 1.0 och den bör vi jobba med och vi lär väl säkert få revidera den efter, efter, efter sommar. Och som Din sa, en av utbildningarna det är det som kallas för movement preparation eh, och den är då riktad till idrottsledare. Eh, vi spelade in den, vi gjorde en sån i onsdags i Umeå 
Och vi spelar in den med tog hjälp av ett bra videoproduktionsbolag, tre kamerasystem. Eh, vi hade 120 deltagare som då fick de var 15 minuters intro, teori, fysikalitusi, tankarna bakom, vetenskapen bakom och sen så gick det igenom alla de här fem delarna i Moment Preparation då, och deltagarna var med. Så den finns den är färdig om en tio dagar ungefär och syftet med den det är ju för att liksom hela svenska idrott ska kunna få i sig det så fort som möjligt då. Uh, bra, alltså instruktörer, det här är inget. 23 stycken, de fick samma vart kan det vara. 9 timmars utbildning, men det igår och i förra uh, Och det är blivande rörelseinstruktörer då. De, fick, de gjorde då en introduktionsutbildning och så gjorde de P3, A och B. Och så ska de då få göra C och D under året. Förhoppningsvis, de ska, några av dem ska verkligen vara igång på att utbilda andra eh, redan inför läsåret i hösten. Ehm, och för att vi ska nu kunna utbilda mer så behöver vi hjälpa din fortsättningsvis. Och din, han är med oss, han har eh, under några perioder kommande året. I september, november, mars och sen september nästa år. <coughs> And now January 25th, Ja, men vi kan extend that, that would be great. Uh, så so planen är då att um, se till så att vi kan sprida i Sverige så mycket. Så att vi tar på oss om rollen och koordinerar så att vi får ut så mycket som möjligt av, av din och hans närvaro uh, i Sverige. Och då när vi räknar lite grann på det här är ju CISO Västerbotten så kommer vara ha en koordinerande funktion. Fredrik Holgen där. Så tror jag att vi kan då få med oss åtminstone sju distrikt och orter, slash orter, som då kan börja ta de här första stegen under det här året, 2018-2019. Och ni är ju först ut, ni är första, jag har förstått det är ganska stort intresse, så om vi kan göra sju så var det långt mer sju som är intresserade så. Så det är väl mycket troligt att nästa grej vi kan göra då här, det är i september till hösten då. Mm. Och sen har vi ju i Umeå, som din nämnde, vi blev klart för några dagar sedan. Ett, ett samarbete då med Sport for Life, Kanada som driver International Physical Literacy. Konferenserna, att vi då gör det första i Europa nästa år. Det blir 450 delegater, det är den tänkta storleken minst. Och en tredjedel utländska, en tredjedel från hela Sverige. Och en tredjedel mer lokalt till Umeå då. Men kapaciteten finns för att göra dubbelt så stor. Vi har den lokala förberedd, men tanken ska vara spännande. Och det här är en jättemöjlighet för hela Sverige. För då kommer det in, det finns en hel hög som din, eller en handfull som din, som är experter på det här, som då blir kärntruppen, keynote speakers under de här dagarna. Men vi kommer också ta in andra experter på andra områden, även från Sverige. Så, så bygger vi upp innehåll som passar då olika behov, både för idrottens behov, det kan vara vi kan få göra någonting vad gäller arkitektur och samhällsplanering kan vara en sak och så. Mm. Så att det är det som är på, på gång här näst. Det är liksom en ganska stor kampanj kan man säga för att sprida fysik och elektrosy i Sverige. Och där idrotten genom den satsning som gör den så kallade skolsatsningen blir ju, idrotten blir den naturliga ledaren som tar lid. Både på nationell plan och även på, på det lokala planet. Så jag tänker bara avsluta med att säga att det som vi tycker är coolt med fysik och literacy som vi fastnar för, som vi blir bara mer och mer sålda på, att det här är ju liksom en någon gemensam ledstång för både alla de som jobbar med att vi ska få bättre hälsa på barn och unga, men också för de som vill att de ska prestera bättre, om det är i skolan eller idrotten. Men sen är det också en bra grej för alla de som vill bygga attraktiv attraktion, typ destinationer. För det är nu för tiden att har jag lärt mig att det är lite skifte. Förr så flyttade folk dit jobben fanns. Nu är det tvärtom. Jobben uppstår där folk vill bo. Och i det perspektivet så är det här kanske en lysande grej att satsa på det. För organisationer kan det också vara en viktig grej ur ett attraktionsperspektiv. Som Baltikgrupp exempelvis då, som brinner för Umeå och vill bevisföra det genom att göra saker som är verkningsfulla och bra på riktigt. 
så är det ju klockrent att engagera sig i sådana här projekt med, med en sån här insikt i grunden. Så att det känns jättelovande och kul att jobba med och jättekul att det är många fler som har hakat på. Ja, jag tror jag stannar där och vi har väl kanske inte någon minut över, men om det är någon fråga till, till mig eller din så kanske vi snabbt kan ta den. Absolut. Stort som smått. Annars hänger vi ju kvar lite grann, det är väl lite lunch och så. Ja, precis. Vi kan we'll stay here for like five minutes, that's okay, before lunch. Nej. Yeah, if anyone has a question. Nej. Okej, okay, perfekt. Uh, stanna om ni har någon fråga till någon av dem. Vi tackar så jättemycket, bara för att förtydliga så är detta 2019 då. Ja, precis. Det är 2019. Det stämmer. Vi gör ju även Change the game nu till hösten. Ja, som precis. Är... Den vanliga Change the Game. Ja, Men den, den stora eh, internationella konferensen i Europa är 2019. Ja. Mm. Mm. Tusen tack för att ni tack kom hit och ville vara med.